So, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you here uh, in our second episode of the Wellness Academy. Uh, in case you've missed the first one in this series, the first event that featured uh, um, Patty Mass and Diela uh, Landau, uh, don't worry, it will be featured soon on the YouTube YouTube's uh, 50 Greatest Hits of Modern History, uh, and we'll also send you a link for that. Um, before we introduce our great, great speakers for today, uh, we have, we'll tell you a few words about us, about uh, Joy Ventures. Uh, so, uh, Joy Ventures is an investment company. Our primary focus is on uh, consumer products that uh, 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 look on the emotional side of uh, non-clinical populations. Uh, we help startups in different stages of development, of the development cycle and product, uh, product cycles. Uh, and um, uh, like other investment vehicles, we look for some kind of uh, uniqueness in technology uh, uh, or, or some kind of barrier. Uh, unlike other investment company, investment vehicles, uh, we are very interested in the efficacy side and in the science uh, side of, of the product. Uh, so in, we are looking for, to see the, the effect of things. Uh, and we also, uh, if, if we are really lucky, we, we have some kind of understanding of the uh, mechanism mechanism of action. Um, we're also unique in that we invest in academia uh, and in ac academic research. Um, we believe that we could be a bridge uh, to scaling and distributing early technologies that come from academia, uh, not only in the form of papers that researchers usually publish, but also in the form of wrapping it up to the to products and delivering it to 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 uh, to all kinds of populations. Um, so we do fund uh, uh, research in 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 the form of uh, academic grants. Um, we have uh, a cycle going on right now, uh, uh, a grant cycle, and you can see our call for proposals uh, that is on our web on our web page, and also but the the link for that will be uh, soon in the chat uh, uh, window. Um, so this event and the one before it uh, feature uh, prominent researchers from academia that have an, an applicative side to, to their uh, research. Um, and this year's uh, specific uh, um, emphasis is on early technologies uh, or early or, or novel, uh, on novel technologies and novel interventions uh, that have um, a side of, uh, that can, can improve emotional well-being. So, I think uh, that after these words of introductions, it's, it's oh, uh, one last thing. Uh, we are, we will dive in now to, to, the, to the talks from uh, Manus Tsukiris and from Hussam Haik. Um, and uh, we have a Q&A place here. Uh, so, just uh, write your questions. And in the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, so uh, please feel free to, to write throughout the talks and then we'll, we'll get to the questions. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Manos Takiris, uh, who is a professor of psychology at the Department of Psychology, uh, Royal Holloway, University of, of London, where he leads the lab of action and body. His research is highly interdisciplinary and uses a wide range of methods to investigate the neurocognitive mechanisms that shape the experience of embodiment, self, and social relatedness in humans. He is the recipient of the Young Mind and Brain Prize in 2014 
and the 22nd Experimental Psychology Society Prize in 2015, and then NOMIS Foundation Distinguished Scientists Award in 2016. Six, since 2017, he is leading the In the South Earth ERC consolid uh, Consolidated Project at Royal Holloway that investigates the role of, inter uh, of interoception for self and social awareness. Uh, Manos, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Hagit, uh, for the invitation and the kind words. Uh, thank you all for attending. I'll try to share my screen and share my PowerPoint uh, with the hope that everything will work out well. Uh, I hope you can see my screen, right? Yes, that's perfect. And you can see my PowerPoint, not the presenter's view. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's uh, start then. So when, when I got the invite to present to you, I thought that I would like to give a state of the art of interoceptive research, because I think this ties very much with the idea of well-being. And I will say a few things about the science behind it, but also towards the end of my talk, I will say a few words about the implications for technology and society. So I'm an experimental psychologist by training, and if you look at the history of psychology, I think uh, for quite some time now, psychology has focused on the experience of the body as a starting point for the science of the self. And at the beginning, the focus on the body was very much on how we perceive our bodies from the outside. And you can think about the process of recognizing ourselves in the mirror or you can think about how the brain integrates different uh, sensory signals to create the sense of body ownership, the feeling that this body belongs to me. Now, these are ideas that have been investigated quite a lot in psychology and neurosciences, and they point to the importance of perceiving your body from the outside, what we would call the exteroceptive body, relying on information modalities such as vision and touch. This line of research has been very influential in giving us important insights about the sense of body ownership. So how do we experience that this body belong to me? About the sense of agency, how I, how I experience a sense of control over my own actions. And also about how we make inferences about other people's mental states. In other words, how by virtue of perceiving other people's bodies, facial expressions, body movements and postures, I can make inference about how they feel and why they behave the way they do. However, after a long period of insisting and focusing on that exteroceptive body, it has become clear that we have neglected another side of embodiment, what I would call the interoceptive body. That is the body hidden underneath our skin, the visceral body. Now, a few words about interoception. As a, as a physiological system, interoception concerns all the sensations that come from within our bodies. Think about your heartbeats, think about your respiration, but think also about uh, feelings of pleasure, sexual arousal, unpleasant sensations like pain, uh, think about fatigue, uh, think about thirst, or the homeostatically salient and important states. So at the purely physiological level, interoception serves a critical function, that of homeostasis. In other words, it ensures the stability of the physiological organism. And a lot of people have talked about this internal milieu, the internal environment of the body. Interoception was coined by Sherrington himself in 1906. Then we had the introduction of other concepts like homeostasis, somatic markers, the insular lobe, and the way that Craig theorized about that. And the important thing here is that interoception, all this physiological machinery of the body, ensures the stability of the biological organism, the survival of the organism, but also gives rise to affect and eventually subjective states of feelings and emotions. Now, interoception has uh, witnessed an accelerating uh, focus, and you can see here a nice graph by Sahib Khalsa's paper, and you can see the, the great increase in papers dealing with interoception uh, over the last uh, two decades or so. So suddenly we find ourselves taking seriously this hidden side of embodiment. Now, one thing that uh, interests my lab in particular is not just the physiological operation of interoception, but it's also the implications of interoception for our subjective experience. And while it is true that much of interoception happens outside of awareness, 
we're also capable of being aware of internal states of the body. For example, you do know, or I hope you know, when you are hungry, and that's important, as it is also important to distinguish between different states. In other words, to know when you're hungry rather than angry, and don't uh, confuse one for the other. Similarly, you know when your heart uh, starts racing very fast. And in the lab, for example, we can use different measures to try and see how accurate people are in detecting interoceptive states, such as respiration or heartbeats. And we can classify people along a continuum from a lower to a higher ability to become aware of such internal states. For example, we can use a heartbeat counting accuracy task and classify people along this uh, continuum. Now, this is an important concept because uh, both in clinical and subclinical studies, it had been shown that interoception affects a wide range of cognitive domains as well as psychopathological conditions. For example, the levels of interoceptive awareness are important for one's experience of pain, for medical and explained symptoms, for the experience of negative emotion. It is, it is implicated in anxiety and anxiety disorders, emotion regulation. In other words, people with higher interoceptive abilities that have been shown to be better capable to perform emotion regulation. But it also affects other domains more general, such as decision making and subjective time perception. And with the work we've been doing in my lab, we have also shown how it affects subjective self-awareness. And it also uh, affects a range of behaviors, such as food and water intake, uh, eating patterns, habits, and eating disorders, but also addiction, sexual functioning, and more social domains like empathy. And of course, it has also been implicated in meditation. Now, a couple of years ago, together with my colleague, Alan de Presta, we put together uh, insights from many, from many different disciplines, such as psychology, neuroscience, clinical psychology, but also philosophy, to try and bring together the different insights from the different disciplines on interoception. One of the papers in that, uh, one of the chapters in that book was by Sarah Garfinkel and colleagues, where they provided a very useful classification of the different dimensions of interoception. So on the, on the bottom, you can see things that are actually happening automatically, if you like, uh, the continuous dialogue, for example, between the heart and the brain, the continuous uh, transmission of afferent signals from the viscera to the brain. And as you go further up on the hierarchy, you find more higher order cognitive abilities, such as your interoceptive awareness or your metacognition. In other words, your insight into how accurate you may be in um, detecting and recognizing such visceral states. In addition, it is clear that there are many different interoceptive uh, systems. We have the cardiorespiratory, we have the uh, gastrointestinal, we have um, hormonal uh, influences of interoception and different methods that we use to try and capture uh, both the functioning of these interoceptive systems and people's ability to become aware of such sensations. And over the last decades, we have seen a proliferation of research in this area, tapping into different domains from some very basic ideas that this constant dialogue between the heart and the brain, for example, supports the very function of consciousness. This is influential work by Katrin talombo Dries lab, where she saw that um, a cortical signature of the information that leaves the heart on every single heartbeat to reach the brain actually predicts where, whether people will become aware of visual stimuli. Of course, we have influential work in the domain of emotion. Uh, this is work by Sarah Garfinkel showing that uh, presenting facial expressions at different points of the cardiac cycle, either at systole or diastole, may influence um, people's subjective experience of uh, these presented stimuli. And in my lab, we extended this line of research into the social domain, uh, something which unfortunately it's very um, prominent again in the media because we showed how these signals from the heart to the brain can be hijacked by cultural social stereotypes and accentuate the expression of racial <laughs> behavior. But one of the most important things for me and the research we're doing in my lab is to try and understand this idea of interoceptive awareness. Uh, how people become aware of such interoceptive states and what is the consequence of this awareness. And what happens if you ask people to do a heartbeat uh, awareness task inside the scanner, 
is that you find activity in the insula on the right hemisphere that correlates with people's ability to become aware of interceptive states. And you can see here the insula buried inside the frontal cortex. And what is also interesting is that if you expose people to a different kind of task that probes the exteroceptive body, in other words, how people become aware of the perception of the body from the outside, again, you find activity in the same part of the brain, slightly more posterior, but the same anatomical structure, the insula. So now we have a brain area that is engaged when people become aware of the body from the inside, as when they become aware of the heartbeats, but also when they become aware of the bodies from the outside, as when they look at their bodies. And the insula is also engaged quite often when we become aware of other people's emotional states. And while this is the science of embodiment, the exteroceptive and the interoceptive one have been studied in isolation, I think it is clear, if you look at your everyday life experience of your own body, that you don't experience two different bodies, one from the outside and one from the inside. Instead, we have a more unitary representation of our own bodies. So my question was, how can we think about these two bodies together? In other words, what is the functional importance of these two sides that we have to become aware of our bodies and eventually of ourselves? Exteroception and interoception. And what are the implications for self-awareness? So we try to bring these two sides together and to cash it out, our hypothesis is that if at the physiological level interoception serves the critical function of homeostasis, at the psychological level, awareness of interoceptive states should serve a similar function, the unity and the stability of the self. Unity in the sense that interoception uh, grounds the self in a cohesive, non-hollow body. We're not just two-dimensional images. We don't simply have the appearance of our own bodies and we don't simply perceive ourselves in mirrors, but we have this experience of the body from within. And when it comes to stability, the idea is that interoception may provide some kind of resilience to the organism, to your psychological self, in other words, in response to external influences. And over the years, we've been studying this hypothesis in different domains. For example, we look at how interoception shapes the experience of the self in the self's natural environment, uh, its own body. We also look at how interoception shapes the relations we have with other people. And lastly, we look at interoceptive development. So how interoceptive awareness develops in critical periods of life. And I'm just gonna give three examples uh, that touch upon in these different areas. For example, we have shown that the levels of interoceptive awareness, in other words, how good or bad someone is in becoming aware of interoceptive states, influences the way you experience your body from the outside. In other words, people who don't have very accurate representations of their interoceptive states, they allocate more attention and put more emphasis on exteroceptive signals, how the body is perceived from the outside. And we find that across a range of domains, um, and you find it in both clinical and subclinical populations. Just to give you an example, if you think about body image concerns, in other words, the idea that a lot of people don't feel satisfied with the way they look, or they pay a lot of attention to the way they look, or they objectify their bodies and its sex appeal at the expense of its well-being. These are people that both in clinical and subclinical um, samples tend to have lower interoceptive awareness. So it seems that there is, there is this dynamic um, relation between interoception and exteroception. And the question is, what does this balance serve? I think exteroception is important because it underpins the ability of our brains to assimilate changes in our bodies and in our interactions with others. So we don't want to have a very solidified um, uh, body model, but we want to be able to actually have some kind of plasticity in the representation of our own bodies. And the way the brain responds to exteroceptive signals preserves precisely that. On the other hand, interoception may provide a more stable core as a counterbalancing uh, power in this more dynamic plastic um, nature of exteroception. Just to give you an example of how this plays out, we have a review paper where we looked at both clinical and subclinical populations presented with body image dissatisfaction. 
And by and large, you find that people with lower interoceptive awareness, as I mentioned, they tend to have greater body image dissatisfaction. Now, this link is quite important because anorexia, if you like, is one of the most uh, fatal psychiatric disorders, is one with the greatest uh, mortality rate and one that it's most difficult to treat it. So we, we will be continuing our work in this domain over the next few years. Now, thinking about the relationship with self and others, uh, it seems to me that understanding how you feel and how the world makes you feel is at the core of our relationships with other people. Let me give you one example that we also describe in one of the chapters of the edited volume that, I, um, that we published. This is MM. MM is about 40 years old. She's a female. She's a graphic artist and videographer, and she was working on a documentary about a kidnapping and a murder. She had done her research. She has uh, researched extensively, and she was ready to start filming, but filming never happened. Why? Because a particular event took place. And this is what happened in her own words. I handed the story back to the producer when it became clear that I could not work the script. I kept repeating the same scenes and no amount of color coordinated storylines would help me. I couldn't make a simple decision on spot, she says. What happened? She says, it is my experience that following this event, there's a shift in personality in how emotions are experienced. It is, however, not only emotional blunting, but also an impaired impulse control and disinhibition. As if a grown-up brain has been replaced by a primitive and at times manic brain that, of, that affects higher functioning. There is an indifference and striking lack of fear. My emotions are blunted and there is an unsettling deadness and indifference towards my prior life and aspiration goals. This indifference and emotional blunting was present as soon as I woke up and has not left me since. In general, this led to personality change. In some aspects subtle, in others a profound shift that I find exceedingly difficult to accept, a kind of physiological expression of how I was feeling, zombie-like. And this is a very nice phrase. I was described in the past, she says, by one video critic as a human seismograph, recording the finest shifts in mood and tone. Now I have problems in social settings where I generally might appear antisocial. I force myself to ask questions and engage in, in banter, but more often I forget, I would say that it has changed how I relate to people. I do not relate. Now, what happened to MM? What was this event that she talks about? One, by reading these uh, descriptions, could think that maybe she had a psychotic episode or she had a major traumatic event that led to PTSD or she had a stroke, but she had none of that. It wasn't anything as dramatic as the three, the three things I mentioned. MM was suffering by hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, and she went for an operation that it is still allowed in some countries called endoscopic thoracic sympathectomy. And that uh, operation uh, involves a surgical destruction or disabling of the upper spinal sympathetic nerve trunk. In other words, as a result of this operation, because of the surgical destruction of this afferent pathway from the body to the brain, MM's brain stopped receiving crucial afferent information from the body that is uh, responding constantly to whatever is changing in the environment and to your own body. And as a result of that removal of this rich, afferent information from the body, we observed this, she observed these very profound changes in the way she was experiencing herself and her relations with others. And in my lab, we put forward the idea that this question of how we distinguish between the self and other, at the same time that we're trying to relate to each other, is at the core of social cognition. And you may find it in many different social contexts from emotional contagion, which seems kind of uh, mundane, from in more salient uh, experiences like sharing someone else's pain, but also in more complex situations. And I'm sure that uh, colleagues in Israel appreciate about the difficulties of these very different egocentric perspectives that people or social groups may have. And in these kind of situations, you have to often overcome self-other distinctions, overcome your egocentric biases to appreciate the perspective of other individuals or social groups. And I think that interoception, as we argued, goes at the heart of self-other relations. It is through a good enough awareness of how you feel, what your own bodily states tell you about you, that you can relate to others as subjects that are distinct from yourself, that may have different 
interoceptive states. In other words, the brain needs to distinguish between your own interoceptive states and what is being affected in your own viscera in response to the other person. And we're doing a series of experiments, experiments now where we're trying to experimentally manipulate and control this process. And lastly, let me say a few things about interoceptive development, because even though we know that interoception is crucial for emotional regulation, for example, we know practically nothing about how interoception is developed in early life. So we're starting now a longitudinal study where we looked at the development of interoception in the first three years of life and try to map this interoception, uh, this development of interoception, the physiological and psychological level to different processes that we know are important for the development of the self in early life, such as self-recognition, uh, intermodal perception, but also relationships with carers. Of course, one major problem is how do you measure interoceptive awareness in infants. We don't have a task for that, but luckily together with some colleagues, Lara Meister and Teresa Tang, we developed this infant heartbeat discrimination task that as it appeared, it, it is suitable for measuring interoceptive sensitivity in very early life and also quantifying individual differences. This is a lucky guy who took part in our experiment and what is happening in this experiment is that the infant is looking on a screen and there is a cartoon character that jumps up and down. Now, importantly, this cartoon character jumps up and down either in synchrony with the infant's own heartbeat or out of sync. And just to give you an example of how it looks like. Eventually, the infant will get bored and uh, he will start looking elsewhere. And then we need to attract his attention back. And this is a new trial. So basically what we're measuring here is preferential sequential looking time. So how much time infants spend looking at the cartoon character that it's synchronized with their own heartbeat and how much they spend looking at the cartoon character that it is decoupled from their own heartbeat. And by and large at the group level, we find that infants spend more time looking at the asynchronous cartoon character. In other words, the one that it's not resonating with his own heart. But of course, as you can see in the graph, you can appreciate that there are individual differences. So some infants show this pattern of preference for the asynchronous, whereas other infants may be spending more time looking at the synchronized cartoon character. Next, with the same infants, we did uh, an EEG study where we looked at the heartbeat evoke potential, and this is a cortical signature of the signals leaving the heart on every heartbeat to reach the brain. And we know from adults that adults with a greater capacity for interoceptive awareness. They also have a larger HEP amplitude and we replicate this finding in infants. So infants with a higher discrimination between the asynchronous and the synchronous cartoon character, they also have a higher amplitude. And that is good because now it gives, a, it gives us a task that we can use to measure interoceptive sensitivity in early life and also to quantify individual differences. Now, importantly, we believe that in early life, it is the carers who are actually doing the self-regulation on behalf of the infants. And together with my good colleague, Katerina Fotopulo, we argued that in a way, carers in early life, actually, uh, they have to do this um, mentalization of infants' homeostatic states. They have to engage in some kind of interoceptive inference. In other words, understand what is the underlying cause of infants' different behavioral displays. Why do infants cry? Is it because they're hungry or is it because they're in pain? And provide the contingent response to satisfy that interoceptive um, need. So we're running now two longitudinal studies. One is in infancy, in early childhood, and then we're looking at early adolescence because that's also a critical period for the development of mental health issues. And we're interested particularly in how young adolescent girls transition from pre-puberty to puberty and how their interoceptive abilities change over time in relation to body image. Now, let me just finish by saying a few things um, about um, the importance of all this for things that are at the heart of what we're trying to do. I think it is clear by now that we are who we are because we have the bodies that we have and because our bodies need to stay alive and what our brain, our brain is constantly doing is inferring the causes of our interoceptive fluctuations, our physiological variability. 
It is precisely because of the fact that we are based machines that we have developed the kind of awareness and intelligence that we have. Now, of course, this kind of scientific consensus have um, moved outside of academia and it has, um, it has touched upon different domains of our society uh, and politics and technology. Of course, you know about the movement to quantify uh, one's own body. Um, there are lots of wearable devices out there that measure how many steps you take, how many calories you're having, how many heartbeats you're having, how good sleep you had or not, what's your glucose level and so on. And the question is whether by engaging in such quantification of our bodily uh, functions, we're becoming like crazy accountants, um, losing ourselves in very large uh, data sets appearing in Excel sheets. And whether there's another way of thinking about wearable technology, um, whether we can think about a more embodied, a more embedded and a more empathic type of technology, so rather than measuring things, providing opportunities to people to actually use technology to change a little bit the experience rather than the measurement of their own bodies. And Doppel is a company that I've been working with. Um, I think I'll stop the video in the interest of time. Doppel is a, is a wearable technology that was developed by a group of people here in London. And it's a wearable device that you wear on your wrist, but instead of measuring anything, it actually provides a sensory experience. Doppel vibrates and the vibration it gives you is a heartbeat-like vibration. And people can actually use this vibration to upregulate or downregulate their mood. You can control the frequency and the intensity of the vibration. And we have shown together with the company in an experimental uh, research that we published that people can actually use this kind of technology to uh, stay a bit calmer in social contexts where there is high arousal. So for me, that is an interesting proposal to think of technology that it's not simply measuring things because what can one do if I know that I don't sleep well or if I know that I'm anxious and instead provide the means by which people can actually understand and even change something about the experience of their own bodies. Another domain that is becoming quite prolific in technology is that of effective computing. The idea and the promise that maybe you can um, use algorithms to actually tell you how you feel. And one could think that you can use physiological signals from one's own body, such as changes in heart rate, skin conductance, and so on, or even facial expressions to tell to people that, you know, today was not a good day for you. You, you seem to have been quite anxious or sad. I do have some problems with that, that are both scientific and political, if you like. And from the scientific point of view, I think there are several different issues. One is that large part of the population of ourselves are effectively poor. In other words, we have poor effective insight. Also, there is uh, weak evidence for unique neurophysiological fingerprints of specific emotions. And context may differentially impact both emotional experience and expression. And I'm just curious about the accuracy, validity, reliability of these kind of measures, especially when these are targeted to people who are not very good at understanding their own emotions. And what are the dangers of actually providing a label to people's unrecognizable affective experience? So assuming that somebody doesn't really know how he or she feels, but suddenly an algorithm or a software tells you that you're angry. We know that emotions are important drivers of behavior. So depending on the label that you get and how much you believe, then there may be some interesting top-down effects in biasing people's behavior uh, in response to specific effect labels. And finally, it is important to realize that emotions are becoming key in our political lives. Uh, a lot of people say that we live in the age of anxiety or fear or anger, and different countries and different parts of populations in different countries may have different emotions. And it is important to understand the centrality of emotions in uh, not just what we investigate in the lab, but also in, and not just in terms of individual well-being, but how we operate within social groups as citizens in democracies or different political systems. So with that, I just want to finish by saying that the body is indeed political, as um, you know, people have known for quite some time uh, in different social struggles about uh, human rights as it became very clear during the pandemic, 
uh, when you find different parts of the population uh, being more severely affected by COVID, but also with the very sad uh, events that have been unfolding for centuries in the US, but they came back um, to the forefront with the murder of George Floyd. So the body is political and how we think about the body in science and in technology is also part of this political uh, discussion. With that, I want to thank all the people who have, who have been working and collaborating with me over the years and our funders and thank all of you for your attention. Thank you, Manos. This was amazing. Thanks you so much. Uh, we're not letting go of interoception and body awareness just yet. Uh, we're turning to Hossam and then we'll go back in the Q&A to, to, uh, to the questions from, uh, um, Thank you. from, from the audience. Uh, I would now uh, like to, to, uh, um, uh, to introduce Hossam. Hossam Haik is a full professor in the Technion. Uh, Israel Institute of Technology and head of five major European consortia. Uh, highly multidisciplinary in nature, the research of Professor Haik focuses on novel solid state and flexible devices, sensors, as well as electronic sensory uh, nanoarrays, uh, non invasive diagnosis of, of disease via volatile biomarkers. Professor Haik's uh, comprehensive approach comprises material and device development, system integration, testing in the lab and clinical environments, and exploitation of project result hardware. Professor Haik has received more than 72 prizes and recognitions, including the Knight of Order, Order of Academic Palms, uh, the Humboldt Senior Research Award, the Michael Bruno Prize and the uh, Chang Jiang Award, uh, the Oxygen Award, and many more uh, teeth breaking uh, <laughs> names. Uh, Hussam, the floor is yours, please. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, hello everybody and uh, good evening. Actually, I will start with the last few slides of the previous uh, uh, speaker, Manos, uh, about wearable devices. And this will be the focus of my talk, uh, what we can do with the uh, wearable devices for measuring, measuring psychological stress or sh uh, psychological disorder. And there are two approaches how to do it uh, these days. The first approach is called physical approach which relies uh, on uh, detection and follow-up of vital signs, as has been uh, uh, presented by uh, Manos. Nevertheless, uh, these approaches today technologically are quite limited in terms of accuracy. Uh, and therefore, there is a need to add to the wearable device some chemical viewpoint, namely chemical sensors which can detect and follow up biomarkers so that we can increase the accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And therefore, uh, uh, though uh, my group work also in the development of vital signs uh, and uh, related sensors and non-invasive diagnostics, uh, the focus of my talk today will be on the chemical side because this is much more innovative uh, in this sense. And uh, therefore, I would like to start uh, what we are anticipating with uh, uh, a device, a diagnostic or monitoring device which could uh, detect a given disorder such as psychological stress, uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, effect, etc., etc. And actually, with that wearable device, we uh, have to uh, expect that the device is easy to operate fast. Namely, we can get uh, results online, on-site as well. The cost has to be low, um, something uh, equivalent to a smartwatch or even less. And the device has to be portable as well and non-invasive. Non-invasive is the most important part of it because otherwise um, uh, we will have cross contaminations and we will have uh, surgical effects and sometimes bleedings uh, or uh, uh, exposures. 
uh, and therefore non-invasiveness is the most important part of these wearable devices. And of course, uh, if we can increase the accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity of the results, that would be the best that we can achieve. And as such, there are uh, several approaches how to do so. One approach is to make diagnosis of disease from exhaled breath. And for that, uh, uh, 10 years ago, we had to do uh, a huge uh, experimental studies and clinical studies worldwide in order to prove that uh, uh, in our breath, we have uh, 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 many uh, 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 secret agents of disease that could be uh, correlated with the stage, with the grading, as well as with the nature and the genetic mutation of the disease. And therefore, after a lot of studies that uh, went over uh, 8,000 uh, individuals in 19 clinical centers worldwide in several continents, uh, we have uh, uh, a conclusion by which we could uh, see that once a disease develops in the human body, it starts to emit volatile organic compounds in the blood. These volatile organic compounds, which has high vapor pressure, they have to emit outside of the human body and they can do it either from breath or from skin. Once they appear in the breath, they can uh, appear at uh, very low concentrations of part per billion or tens of part per billion. And similarly, you can find those throughout the skin, simply in an invasive way. With this approach, actually, uh, we have went into further clinical studies, uh, as could be seen on the screen, in several continents. And we have explored a way to detect, with this approach, 19, 17 uh, uh, disorders and diseases and their uh, uh, stages as well. As you can see uh, on the x-axis, which you have here, uh, we have 17 types of different disease. And here you can see that we have the number of those biomarkers that are significantly appear uh, from one disease and can differentiate one disease from the other disease. And as you can see here, if you can compare the combination of these biomarkers of the lung cancer, they are rather different than the fingerprint of those of the colorectal cancer, those of the ovarian cancer, or from Parkinson or Alzheimer or multiple sclerosis. In other words, exactly as every person has a unique fingerprint that distinguish a person from another person, and we have found that there is a unique breath print that could distinguish one person from another person as well as one disease from other disease. Naturally, when we say a, a, a disease, we can also say that today we have proven uh, that we have a unique fingerprint of disease versus the control groups, namely those that are having no disease or healthy people. Of course, all of that supported by uh, clinical evidences and uh, 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 hundreds of uh, papers that has been published, but I think this is uh, something that uh, could make the job uh, 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 quite good. Nevertheless, all of these uh, proof of concept, which we have done in the past, uh, was uh, uh, provided by mass spectrometry techniques, which many of you uh, use, uh, which is a quite heavy device, uh, quite expensive, and it takes something like uh, three to five hours in order to get the uh, analysis done. And the challenge was right now engineering challenge to take all of this device and to monitorize it to a wearable device that you can use according to the criterions which I have mentioned earlier in my, uh, in my first uh, two slides. And therefore, we have developed a, de a device that imitates in its uh, uh, operation the olfaction system of the human. And this device... Uh, <laughs> This uh, device practically collect those volatile biomarkers that are linked with the disease with an array of cross-reactive sensors that are based on nanomaterials. Once these compounds adsorb to the sensors, they produce electrical signal, which we transfer to digital signal. And once uh, we have a lot of these digital signals from many sensors, array of sensors, we apply artificial intelligence and we train the system how this combination of signals could correlate to a given disease or to other type of uh, 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 disease. In other words, we have developed a device that is a trainable device. You can train the device uh, uh, according to the type of the disease. What 
whatever you need to do is to expose it to the right samples and to train it by the artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, if you want to look at this device, so this device uh, uh, today uh, from A to Z, all the components uh, looks like uh, uh, the one which you see here in blue and white color. The person can exhale uh, into the device from um, uh, three to four centimeters more or less. No uh, direct contact between the mouth and the device uh, it should be done. Once uh, uh, this happens, uh, the device will collect the breath and interact the biomarkers with the array of sensors and the results will appear immediately on the, into the screen. So this is online device. Actually, the size of the device is like this uh, size only. All of this part is empty to, due to um, uh, product design issues. But in terms of monitorization, this device even can be connected to a smartphone device with the USB uh, quite conveniently. Uh, the device has been went uh, into clinical studies in 19 clinical centers worldwide on more than a thousand patients and uh, uh, with this device we could detect uh, again uh, 17 types of different disease of course this is what we have tried we can try more and as you can see we could discriminate between several types of disease as could be seen from the comparison on this part of the uh, figure the red color to who uh, don't see the results are above 90% accuracy in discrimination between one type to the other type of disease, which are quite promising results that says that we can not only diagnose a disease, we can also differentiate between different or independent uh, diseases as well. One question you might ask, uh, uh, maybe this is an effect of confounding factors, this is a geographical effect or genetic effect some, somehow, uh, not a real result of the disease per se. And the answer is quite easy if you'll take a look on this graph. This graph actually, uh, uh, we have taken control groups for every group of diseased people uh, in the same centers and we have uh, compared the control groups uh, uh, each uh, with the other. And as you can see, most of the colors are between uh, green and yellow, saying that there is no discrimination between the healthy group in France uh, to those in China or to those in uh, uh, United States or in Israel. Meaning that the, the, the results which we have got here are the pure result of the disease per se, not the effect of the confounding factors. Uh, without going into uh, much details, uh, we have uh, went uh, into further uh, research uh, in this endeavor and we could see that we can uh, distinguish not only between a zero or one healthy or diseased, but rather we could distinguish between a disease and the subcategories of the disease, such as in this representative example of the lung cancer, we, we could discriminate between benign and malignant tumor, but much more important between the early stages of the disease and the advanced stages of the disease. And this is quite a critical point. If we can detect the uh, disease at the early stages before the symptoms appear, the survival rate or the treatment management is much higher by many, many folds. And this is the most critical part of it, the early stages. And I'm, I'm glad that we could succeed to make the early stages in the kind of cancer, uh, cancers, we could even go to the dysplasia uh, 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 part uh, at the very early stages of the cancer where we could detect it uh, in 5,000 patients, uh, more or less. Of course, we have done similar work with uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer, and as you can see on the screen quite briefly, the accuracies are uh, uh, good, between 81% to 88% uh, accuracy with multiple sclerosis as well. The results were pretty good uh, um, if we uh, want to distinguish between uh, uh, a remission re state and uh, a, a, a elapsing state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The more interesting point, which I want to discuss, because this is uh, directly connected uh, to um, our funded project uh, by the Joy Venture, is uh, the uh, need to uh, follow up psychological stress and to discriminate the different stages of the psychological stress with the wearable device that can stick on the skin in an invasive way in a tattoo-like manner. 
And the idea is to develop a device that can be uh, uh, stick into the skin and it can detect both the vital signs, which you have heard from uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker, but we will do it not in a watch-like, but rather we will do it in a tattoo-like uh, device. And this device, uh, uh, because it's quite thin, also it's quite sensitive to scratches and it's quite sensitive to cut. And therefore, uh, with this device, we implement a new technology which is called self-healable technology or self-repairing technology in the sense that once uh, in uh, uh, the user's uh, daily life, uh, the device was scratched or cut. And just remember this electronic device, the device can heal itself in autonomous way. It can repair itself exactly like our skin when we get scratched. Furthermore, the device don't need any kind of battery. It can operate itself and generate uh, 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 the electricity based on the movement of the human body. So with this approach, we wanted to develop it further. And just to give you a, a, an idea how things look like, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, this is a, an electronic device, purely electronic device called field effect transistor. It includes uh, six, uh, five electro, uh, field effect transistors. Namely, uh, you know, uh, transistors similar to those which found in our computer. But as you can see, the patch uh, thickness it's two micrometer only, and you can just put the device in quite easy way on this uh, skin, exactly as we put the tattoo for our kids. And I'm an expert in that. <laughs> And as you can see, uh, you simply just put uh, the tattoo on a piece of uh, uh, paper. You wet the paper uh, um, for uh, around 20, uh, 30 seconds, more or less. Of course, we speed up the video in this case. And then you peel off the uh, uh, paper. And as you can see, uh, the device is stuck into your skin. Uh, and the, uh, 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 the operation of the uh, follow-up and monitoring of the biomarkers of the disease or the psychological stress start to be done throughout skin in an invasive way. Right now, the question how we transfer the data to the smartphone. Actually, we can bring our smartphone and we bring it quite close to the device and by a technology which is called RFID or NFC, uh, we operate with the smartphone, the uh, patch, and uh, we get the signal uh, back to the smartphone itself. Of course, we can put Bluetooth, which you know from our daily life, but Bluetooth will increase the thickness of the device and will complicate uh, uh, issues. So we prefer this way uh, and a, a, this manner. Of course, I, I have promised you that the device is quite self-healable. Namely, if it's scratch, it can repair itself. And this is an example uh, that the device uh, works, as you can see, it operates this uh, LED. Uh, the device is connected by wiring uh, here. Right now, we will not scratch the device. We will cut it. Simply, we will go to the most extreme part of it. We will cut the device. Uh, and you can try, if you cut any device uh, uh, and even you bring it back, it will not repair. As you can see, uh, after we speed up the video, the device start to repair itself step by step until a full functionality of the LED will uh, 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 restart. So we will wait a few seconds and we will speed up the video and step by step we will see flashing in this case which indicates that the device started to reoperate again and can go back to the original phase. Right now, uh, um, uh, this device, uh, if you ask whether we can, uh, how, where we can use it or whether the healing can be done uh, underwater or uh, in air, um, of course, you can just read the a few publications from the last few days. Uh, and uh, you can see that this device works both in air and underwater. Uh, this device, actually, it's the old version. The new version can do the self-healing or self-preparing within only three seconds, only three seconds, and it can do it also underwater. It doesn't matter. And it can go up to 1,000 scratches or cut. This is what we have tried in the, uh, in the lab, and we are still fine, and the device works uh, quite uh, good and in self-sustainable way. 
With this device, we have uh, went into discrimination of those markers which can appear from skin and that could correlate it with the health of the person and the psychological stress of the person. And as you can see, we could see that we could discriminate those markers of the disease from uh, the skin in a quite nice way. As you can see here from the different colors, we could distinguish the biomarker or the markers and we could distinguish them at different concentrations because each of these points is different concentration of the marker. But nevertheless, when we have cut the device and then we have just put it back together and we have tried the same uh, experiment a day after, you can see that we got similar map more or less with a little bit shifts here and there, which indicates that the self-healing worked not only mechanically, but also in terms of chemical sensor and uh, uh, for psychological stress markers, it works quite nice. Something else with this device that we have done, we have done uh, animal models. We have taken uh, an, a preliminary uh, uh, result, eight uh, uh, animals uh, in stress uh, state and eight animals in control state. Uh, of course, we have uh, done uh, the uh, stress uh, effect uh, with different techniques, uh, for example, with under trauma, uh, underwater trauma. And we have done it uh, uh, and we have measured the, the animals uh, one day before, one hour after, and one week after. And as you can see, we have got sensors like those which could distinguish between the two states in quite nice way between the stress and the control groups. Of course, right now we are working with an, our, our grant to distinguish the subcategories of the stress, namely uh, the different stages of the stress. And this is what we uh, have uh, uh, to do. Actually, we have good progress, which we will report uh, later on on it. Something else that is quite important, we don't work only with sensors in the black box approach, but rather what we have done is to go with the uh, mass spectrometry. These are further results of what we have shown. We have went into mass spectrometry and we have found five markers, chemical markers which are emitted from the skin and we can detect with our sensors and the markers and uh, their uh, 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 statistical significance there you can see on the uh, uh, screen, something that validate uh, our approach, not only in terms of sensors, but also in terms of mass spectrometry. Namely, we have right now both the basic science in hand and the technology and the applied research on the other hand and the uh, uh, applications as well. Um, right now we are working uh, with the same uh, rat, uh, with the same model, uh, animal models in order to make uh, further subcategorization of the stress and to increase the statistical uh, value in that uh, uh, case. And uh, um, these are the models which you are quite experienced with uh, that we use. We uh, try with elevated uh, uh, plus uh, maze with the open field also uh, uh, where with the animal model we have uh, uh, our patch on it uh, quite directly. Uh, in parallel, uh, uh, we have uh, good results right now with uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder with this patch, uh, with real clinical study in Shiba Talashumer, uh, in co uh, our collaboration. Uh, we, we have started, we have a few uh, individuals that has been examined, but uh, the coronavirus has stopped our uh, experiment in the meanwhile. Uh, but, uh, and therefore I will not report uh, on any result yet because I believe in statistics. So I want to make sure that the statistics are quite valid before we can uh, proceed with any report. But I can tell in informal way, even though I uh, see that the uh, uh, lecture uh, is recorded. In informal way, I, we can see that the signals which we have get from the preliminary data are excellent. But again, I believe in statistics and I will wait for the next phase to report on it uh, after uh, we will do so. Of course, this is something that we will do as a proof of concept and the next, in the next year we will do much larger clinical study with this uh, approach with the patch. Uh, even though the breath analyzer, uh, which I have reported in the first part of my uh, uh, talk, was not part of uh, the joint venture uh, uh, propo uh, uh, proposal, we have included as well and we do uh, experiments as well with it. With this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm ready for any question if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Hussam. That was wonderful. 
Um, yeah, so uh, let's uh, let's see what questions we have right now. Um, so uh, the first questions are addressed to Manos. Um, first of all, uh, Gal is asking, uh, can you please address the work of Heart Math Institute and the concept of heart coherence? Good question, but I don't think I'm qualified enough to, to address this, uh, this work. Um, you know, there are a lot of people working in different uh, aspects of interoception. Uh, I know of the work, but I haven't really delved into it, so I, I wouldn't go there. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question is uh, relationship in either direction between interoception and the physical environment. This is Randy asking. Um, it's, it's difficult when we cannot have a dialogue, but I shall I suppose that by physical environment, um, you mean nature? Uh, it's, it's difficult. I mean, uh, of course, one would think about, you know, the kind of conditions in modern life that may actually lead to um, dysregulation of, of the body. Uh, and that, of course, can be due to social stressors, you know, the kind of lives that we live in, in urban uh, places. Uh, we do know from different lines of research about the beneficial uh, effects of nature on mood, but you would also expect the same thing to happen in more basic physiological uh, processes like respiration or like digestion and so on and so forth. So, you know, I can see how the physical environment or any kind of environment you live in affects the, um, the processes involved in the biological organism and eventually in your cognition and mood. I'm not sure the, whether we can talk about the reverse direction of causality from interoception to physical environment. So, so I think uh, Randy uh, clarifies that uh, they mean nature or the built environment. Yeah. So I think that, you know, nature or the built environment or any kind of environment imposes a structure, ways of life, ways of behaving and ways of experiencing on the body. And of course, it, they have an effect on how our bodies are engaged in how we experience these bodies. But I'm not sure about the other way of direction. Of course, you know, our cognition and our behavior has a great impact on planet Earth, as we all know. But I wouldn't say that interception is responsible or is solely responsible for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I see two questions still to Manos by Jonathan. Uh, so first of all, uh, can inter uh, interoception be mani manipulated with brain or nerve stimulation? And do these manipulations affect the sense of self? Mm -hmm. uh, and could such manipulations be used to help people with interoception-related disorders? Yes. So this so, is one question. Yeah. <laughs> so a, lot, a lot of things, uh, a lot of things, of course, constantly affect the, the physiological regulation of the body, in other words, interoceptive variables. I guess the most interesting question is whether we can think about uh, ways in which you can manipulate people's awareness of such interoceptive states. There are some evidence, for example, that uh, you, know, you can use brain stimulation to target the insula, which is one of the key structures involved in interoception, and increase people's interoceptive accuracy or awareness how that then translates into changes in emotional experience and emotion or emotional regulation is not uh, known yet. Uh, other ways in which you can affect interoceptive accuracy with brain stimulation or stimulation of the nervous system is by stimulating the vagus nerve. And again, there are some studies showing that this is indeed the case. But again, the last point of seeing how this increase in a lab-based measure of interoceptive accuracy translates into everyday life, that remains to be seen. And I would expect that other interventions like psychotherapy uh, would also improve in general people's emotion regulation probably with, uh, by, by also recruiting or repurposing some basic mechanism by which we become aware of interoceptive states. Um, 
Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, another question uh, from Jonathan is, uh, there is a Buddhist philosophy proposing that craving and attachment depend upon bodily uh, stimu uh, simulation of a rewarding or aversive experience. Uh, do we see this in research on intercep interception and addiction? Uh, well, I think a lot of the research on, on addiction, for example, in neuroscience, uh, has to do precisely with such mechanisms of, of reward and anticipation. Uh, and interception will be at, at the heart of the matter. I think a lot of the studies that uh, have looked at the neural correlates of addiction, for example, uh, point to the critical role of the insula. Uh, of course, you know, there are all, all, all other studies looking at uh, uh, the monogenic systems uh, in, in addiction behaviors. So I don't think that there is such a, such a big um, gap between, you know, more Western scientific uh, theories of such um, phenomena and if you like more philosophical approaches to the experience of one's own body. But it's always a question of where the focus is. Is it on the mechanism or is it on the experience? And we always seem to have this, um, this gap that we have to mind. How do we go from a mechanism to experience or from the experience to the mechanism? Yeah. Um, Hussam, this one is uh, for you. Someone uh, who uh, does not identify themselves uh, is asking, uh, somehow missed the connection between your research and emotional well-being. So I guess it's an opportunity to to uh, to um, to revisit that. Sure. Um, uh, the, the idea uh, the idea today there are uh, a need for sensors to make uh, uh, detection and monitoring of, monitoring of psychological stress. Actually, if you take a look on the companies worldwide, spin-off companies that are connected with Google only, there are uh, more than 100 companies that do entertainment uh, throughout the smartphones uh, for uh, reducing the level of the psychological stress. And of course, all of these uh, softwares, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, in order to know who is stressful, and at what, which stage you need the uh, input to these devices. And this is where we need the wearable device uh, 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 that can give the uh, uh, status of the person in terms of the psychological stress, and then you move it to the smartphone. So the smartphone will do the entertainment or the kind of management um, uh, a, in online manner. Okay, I hope uh, <laughs> I hope this clarified. Um, thank you. Uh, there is another question: Has Robert Becker and Gary Selden's work on the body electric uh, electric influence influenced your work? That's by Carl. Oh. This is to whom? To me. Um, it's not addressed. So if if they if, if this this has influenced either of you yours work, uh, not, not for me. So no no one admits. <laughs> Probably we don't know the the, the names. <laughs> yeah, just a moment. Let's see if uh, we have a clarification from Carl. No. Uh, okay. Uh, but there is another question from, from Randy. I think it's for you, Hussam. Uh, are there potential skin biomarkers for depression, anxiety, and other psychological disorders? Yes, I have shown for psychological stress uh, that we have uh, markers. For the rest, we don't know exactly, but we can uh, examine throughout mass spectrometry and throughout collecting the skin samples by technology which we have developed uh, to, the, to that analysis. So it can be examined for other psychological mm -hmm. uh, disorders. And then there is a question from Gadi, I think also to you, Hussam. Uh, have you looked at HEPs in relation to positive arousal versus stressful arousal as seen in GSR? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, just a sec, I think there is another question by Gadi. Uh, are you aware of body-based interventions such as somatic experiencing and their effect on hep, insula, thalamus, etc.? So I'm not sure if that's addressed to you or to, to Manos. Uh, for me, I have, uh, I have no answer. I think, I think there are a lot of studies uh, looking at the effects of mindfulness and meditation on interoception. Uh, some studies suggest that interoceptive accuracy is improved. Some studies suggest that what is being improved is not performance, but people's insight into whether they're good or bad are treating out internal states of the body. And I think just for the previous question, there are some studies looking at the heartbeat of potential in response to emotions, of course, and the heartbeat of potential is modulated by visual stimuli that may um, have specific uh, affective valence. Of course, much of the research in psychology on emotion has to do with negative emotions. Uh, not surprisingly, these are the ones that seem to elicit the strongest responses uh, and less so in positive emotions. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, we have one last question from Gadi uh, for uh, Hussam. Have you managed to relate between inputs from uh, from the gut vagal uh, afferents to skin biomarkers or breath analysis? Yes, of course. Uh, we have done study on um, around 4,000 uh, individuals and uh, this has been published and there is correlation, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I want to thank you both very much for this excellent lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Thank and you. And I hope our uh, audience uh, did as well. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much. Thanks thank for you. being with us. Thank you for coming and thank you for having us. Okay, <laughs> bye.